On the first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth days of Christmas, my true love gave to me a collection of massive impies. Hello and welcome back to the channel and yes today I'm taking a look at six massive imperial stouts and I know you're already thinking you can't possibly drink six massive imperial stouts all in one go and you'd be right. A bit more on how we're going to do this in a minute though. First off let's just introduce them. These are six massive imperial stouts from my local brewery Blue Monkey who very kindly gifted me these beers. I need to make that infinitely clear the reason they gifted me these beers wasn't actually to do this video though or to do a review on them this this is just for your benefit they gifted me these because i helped them out a couple of weeks ago and put together a little video for them to show on their website i'm going to throw the reel of that up on the screen now or at least a bit of it and yeah i got together with them followed their brewer dan around for an entire day which to be honest was probably quite annoying for him to produce this video which actually i'm quite pleased with in the end but yes as a result of that, they have sent me six fantastic beers, which are all effectively the same beer, but, well, aged in six different barrels completely. For those of you who have been following the channel for a while, you may recall last year I reviewed two Imperial Stouts by Blue Monkey last year, kind of this time last year. One was a bourbon barrel aged and one was a rum barrel aged. Well, that went so well, they took that base beer, their Silverback Imperial Stout, made it even better and spread it across six different barrels and what a six they chose right then let's get into this so starting over here we have a sherry barrel aged imperial stout pretty rare sherry barrel aging stouts i think you'll agree then on to a Speyside barrel aged. So Speyside is a whiskey region of Scotland for those people that don't know. It's typically more lighter honey floral kind of tone so that was going to be something distinctly different to um, the kind of regular bourbon barrel aged stuff you see quite frequently. Then the real outlier in my mind a chili and ginger tequila barrel aged. So that's a tequila barrel with a load of chili and ginger thrown into it. According to everyone at the brewery, actually one of their favourites by a long way, but we'll get onto that more in a moment. The one that I am personally looking forward to the most, an old-fashioned wild turkey barrel-aged imperial stout. So barrel-aged in wild turkey bourbon barrels, but added in a load of Angostura bitters and fresh orange to make something that tastes like the old-fashioned cocktail. I'm a big fan of an old-fashioned cocktail, so that is right up my street. Followed up by a Tonka Bean and Rum Barrel Aged Imperial Stout. Again, rum barrel, I believe it's Appleton Estate rum barrels, this one. And then with a load of Tonka Beans in for an extra bit of flair. And finally, Buffalo Trace Barrel Aged Imperial Stout. That one speaks pretty much for itself. So, how are we going to do this? Well, I have gone through the hard effort and graft of already finding out what three of these taste like just for you. And those are the first three we talked about. The Sherry, the Speyside and the Chili and Ginger Tequila. So we're going to talk about those first. I'm going to review one right here today. And that, as you've probably guessed, is that old fashioned one. Because I'm really excited for that. I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic and right up my street. And then the Buffalo Trace and the Tonka Bean and Rum. To be honest, I'm going to leave for you to find out for yourself should you choose to buy any of these because, well, firstly, it's going to ruin it if I tell you about all of them in great detail. And the other reason I'm leaving these two out is because, well, the Buffalo Trace is effectively what they did last year with that bourbon barrel aged silverback. Was very good, incredible, absolutely loved it. I'm sure this one's even better because, well, time and experience and all that. And then the Rum one, very much the same. It has got the addition of Tonka Bean, so I am quite keen to get into it, but... Look, I don't want to ruin these. I want to savour them. I want to enjoy them. And so those two, I'm going to save for Christmas Day itself, I reckon. But, well, you know, I might get impatient. But anyway, it's not happening today. So what we're going to do first is show you the old-fashioned wild turkey barrel-aged imperial stout can. I'm going to pour it, let it do its thing, warm up a little bit, aerate, and then we'll review it properly. Meanwhile, we'll talk about the three that I have already tried. So then, the one we're getting into today, as I said, Old Fashioned Wild Turkey Barrel Aged Imperial Stout coming in at a whopping 13.2%. Now, I'm not going to 
reel off the ABVs of all of these in one go. I'll maybe I'll put them on the list on the side of the screen now so you can see, but in effect, they're all between 11 and 13 and a half, I believe it is. But here we go. Look at these cans. All these cans follow this pretty much the same kind of design styling. It's got the, um, I, I guess it's an evolution rather than a revolution of what they've been doing this past year with their craft focus range. Um, the nice gorilla on there. This one's got a nice little kind of throwback. I can't remember uh, what the art style is, but kind of, you know, old school kind of throwback, kind of early 1900s, uh, maybe it's art deco. Um, each of them in their own colorway, but yeah, fantastic looking things. There is a bit of info on each one, which we'll get into a little bit later, but yes, absolutely fantastic looking things. They were also kind enough to gift me one of their little craft taster glasses, which I really like these actually. They're kind of like a halfway house between your traditional squat craft um, Allegra style glasses and something a bit more kind of Belgian and open tops, kind of halfway house. Very much digging that, very appropriate for this beer style. One thing I will say, if you do buy any of these, they are very full. They've not been stingy with the can fills, but as a result of that, it can lead to uh, yeah, a bit of a, a bit of a sticky finger situation. Yep, did it again. I can't show you, but that can is to the brim, absolutely to the brim. All right then, let's get this poured out. All right then, I mean, all of these so far have looked absolutely stunning in the glass. Because of that higher ABV, the head rarely sits around, to be honest. However, this one, doing better than most of them, I'll talk about those when we get to those in a minute, looks nice, kind of thin, uh, distinctly tan-coloured head. There is absolutely no surprise here that this is an absolutely jet, jet black beer. And... Uh, yeah, it just looks absolutely fantastic. I'll give you some initial aroma notes now, then we'll put it down, talk about the others, and come back to it properly at the end. But, oh, massive orange hit. Like, fresh, juicy, zesty, pithy, the whole orange, it feels like, is in here. Because of that boozy element, it's putting together something that feels a bit like Cointreau and kind of orange liqueurs, but I'm pretty confident they haven't done that. I'm talking to the brewers. I'm pretty confident this is all proper fresh orange in here. Bitters not coming through the Angostura bitters, that is, um, you know, the, the cocktail component. It's a little bit of deep, dark chocolate roastiness from the malt, but the orange is taking centre stage. And we all know orange beers can be really tricky. Like, they can come across synthetic, overdone, feel a bit like, you know, detergent and all the rest of it. This, this is the most authentically orange beer I've ever had the pleasure of sticking my nose in. And... Well, that's because it, it is. It's just oranges and absolutely all the better for it. There must have been heaps in there because it smells oh, absolutely delicious. Now, I'm going to stick this down slightly further out of the way because what I don't want to do is knock that over because it would be a very sad day. Right then, into the beers that I've already had. Now, I kick things off with... The slightly obscure one, well not the most obscure, but the obscure one for a relatively straightforward one. The Sherry Barrel Aged Imperial Stout at 12.1%. I don't know why I chose this, I just thought I didn't want to do one of the really out there ones, but I wanted to experience something a bit different. And this really surprised me because you don't see a lot of Sherry Barrel Aged stuff and Sherry I don't really care for a lot, if I'm honest. It wasn't really there. But what this did with the Imperial Stout brought out a huge amount of the actual core sherry components, red wine effectively, which actually I really do get on with. Now, you'll have to excuse me because I'm gonna have to read notes off my phone because I made some in-depth in notes here and uh, I'm not fancy enough to have a proper auto cue set up. So, on the sherry barrel aged, the head was uh, a thin coffee head, pitch black, head did not stick around on this one. The aroma was deep, boozy black currant, sultanas, sweet licorice and fruity espresso. On the very tip of the tongue, it was dark roasty malt. Over the first third, it was clean, dried grape, and a hint of salinity, which helped balance the beer beautifully. For those who don't know what salinity is, it's kind of salt water, but it's not its not that obvious. It's just kind of this background thing. It's almost, think about like salt as a seasoning. It's kind of doing a similar thing. Salinity is something you often get in a lot of coastal Scotch whiskies. I've talked about it before with things like Old Pulteney. I could find it in that, and it really helped just kind of balance off those deeper, darker, richer fruit notes. Over the mid palette, the blackcurrant and dark fruits really came back in. Light spritzy combination and hints of dark roasty bitterness from the malt. On the back of the tongue, Rioja wine. That's really like the wine came in big and strong. Pronounced enough like 
my mind instantly went to like a Rioja Reserva. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, it has a solid but enjoyable boost of boozy heat at the end. Starting to get really prickly, really warming. And the aftertaste was again another splash of salinity, dried fruit with a drying sensation and a dark and fruity roast finish. So a lot of the flavours there very much in the same wheelhouse. That salinity really helping to balance things out with the sherry barrel aged version. But yes, that was absolutely solid a big surprise for me that one because i really thought i wasn't gonna be all that bothered about it uh, worth pointing out right now that i'm not actually the biggest imperial stout fan i'm very appreciative to have the chance to do this and try all of these but in general when i'm going searching for beer it's got to really stand out for a big impy stout for me to be like oh yes because i don't know i just yeah this it's not my day-to-day -day kind of thing although given the abvs on this probably shouldn't be anyone's day-to-day -day kind of thing but you get what I mean? Second up then was the one that everyone was raving about. The Chili and Ginger Tequila Barrel Aged Imperial Stout at 12.2%. Visual on this one was exactly the same really as the Sherry one. Kind of head didn't really stick around, was quite thin. But the aroma on it was dark, roasty and almost treacle like base with sweet molasses and a hint of spicy heat. Uh, on the tip of the tongue, it was mildly spritzy with a mixed fruit and cola-like taste. That is one thing that really took me by surprise. It had this kind of Coca-Cola vibe, which, again, sounds a bit of an odd thing coming from a beer review perspective. But actually, it is a common note in a lot of whiskey tastings. I know we're not dealing with whiskey here, but especially seems to be a thing that happens when, you know, the extra amount of ABV gets involved with the woody notes of the barrel and then some other fruity bits. Yeah, you can end up with a cola taste quite a lot of the time and uh, it was present in that and it was really good actually really delicious uh, over the first third of the tongue it was oddly refreshing i've written down uh, the tequila is evident but delivers with something more akin to a rice wine or a japanese malt whiskey um, maybe even sake is actually where i was really going with that in my head given rice wine in japanese but yeah you get the idea which again didn't it wasn't distinctly tequila, but you could tell it was if you were looking for it, if that makes sense. But yeah, uh, the mid palate was initially back to the base beer, rich toasted multi notes, but quickly taken over by a slow warming heat. Initially, it felt like the tequila itself was coming through, but then it reveals itself to be fruity hot sauce territory. The chili properly, properly coming out to play. It was really funny. You got like, the, you know, the good experience from hot sauce, the bit you want, the flavor, the really well balanced fruity notes but with a bit of heat and that's exactly what it was it wasn't too hot it wasn't spicy it wasn't fiery but well it was but it wasn't painful i think is what i'm really trying to get across uh onto the back of the tongue the chili continued and intensified more heat less sweet it started to get a little bit pokey uh and then with a touch of festive ginger started to come in there which really just helps kind of bring home these are Christmas specials after all. Um, the aftertaste was depthy, the fruity cola returned which was a welcome treat after that heat. The candied ginger boldens really kind of you know sweet candied ginger very festive. Um, some softer roasted coffee and burnt caramel notes from the beer itself start to come in with that ever lingering soft chilli heat. I said overall a dynamic but still super balanced beer. It shouldn't work but as a result makes it even more endearing because it just absolutely does. That was absolutely beautiful. And then finally the space side this i wasn't sure how i was going to go down i really like space side whiskey by the way i thought i was going to like it but this is how do i explain this imperial stouts are often praised for their outrageousness i want to appraise this one for its subtlety and its consideration so the visual was by far the best of the bunch so far and actually is better than the one we just poured out. It retained its head for an awfully long time compared to the rest of them. It is 11.7%, which might be white, it's just a little bit less. Um, the aroma was soft and subtle for an MP. Dark fruits and licorice from the base beer dominate the majority. Scotch whiskey tones come through, but it's in the background. Being a space side barrel, it's not intense and smoky, but the regular floral and hooded notes you'd expect are also absent. It's a woody Scotch silhouette and nothing more. It was just a suggestion of a Scotch whiskey and it wasn't it was not distinguishable in terms of region or anything like that my initial reaction to a sip of it was that this incarnation is all about the beer a showcase for the course out itself i've put that the mouthfeel here is a notable improvement soft and smooth without being thick and cloying fruity licorice and a spritz of heat are the headlines now don't read into that that the conditioning on any of these is bad because it certainly hasn't been so far they are not though what you would call big thick 
kind of decadent imperial stouts. They are, I don't want to just usually say they're thin because that sounds like they're losing a lot of body. They're just on the thinner side of what is kind of normal in imperial stout territory. But this one was just a little bit more looks, had a bit more, I don't know, it didn't look necessarily thicker, but the mouthfeel just felt a bit more premium. Onto the tip of the tongue then, it was super relaxed, hints of the space, I kick it off with mild honey and a balancing oaky depth. Over the first third of the tongue, the oak develops, the honey drops off and is replaced by those dark fruity stout notes peeking in with some dark licorice that were on the aroma. Mid palate, as quickly as they arrive, those dark flavours depart and leave behind some sweeter fruit and almost cherry notes with a very subtle heathery edge. Not sure if I imagine that because of the Scottish connotation, but there was definitely something there. It wasn't piney, wasn't grassy, wasn't mossy. Heather, I think, is the closest I'm going to get to. On the back of the song, the ethanol and raw spirit start to creep in, along with a huge big blast of big dark roast malt it's not distinct enough for coffee or licorice but along with some of the more pronounced barrel notes it makes for a great powerful peak i wrote that in a way that was really difficult to read out loud on the aftertaste the barrel notes and a more distinct space out malt vibe come swinging in to send it out a little alcohol burn in places but with every sip the real outstanding takeaway is just how easily drinkable this is and it absolutely was it went down an absolute treat as the beer warms, it retains the flavours as mentioned, but the scotch notes do start to embolden with temperature. So if you really want to explore the space side vibe to this, have it a little bit warmer. And if you want to see the actual core beer in this, then a few degrees less will allow you to do so. Apparently I got very excited on my notes on this one because they kept going and going and going. I go on to say that basically I can see why bourbon barrels have become kind of the norm for imperial stouts in the UK because they do impart a lot more flavour, mostly because they're only single use by those US distilleries and also the charring of the barrels will impart more flavor than this does um, because it is it's subtle it's softer but that's not always a bad thing and I also go on to say that towards the end of the glass the aroma switches up to be incredibly rich and almost kind of hot scotch hot toddy territory and the aftertaste acquires a depthy toasty biscuit malt finish that was when it was very very warm so it does change a lot with temperature it does the space side to keep in mind but yes absolutely fantastic I really really enjoyed that one a lot right then over to the main event. In the glass then, it's retained a bit of head, but not too much. It's kind of thinned out in the middle, if you can see there, but high ABV stouts, it's gonna happen. Aroma wise, it has changed. There is a distinct change after these get aired out a bit. So what was before just entirely fresh orange, which was delicious. I'm kind of wishing it was still there, if I'm totally honest, but what is there now is not bad by any means because more of the booze has come up to the fold, more of the core beer, and now distinctly more like Cointreau, more like an orange liqueur, and just a bit of that licorice note from the core stout itself has started to creep in, but otherwise, still absolutely fantastic. Right, let's give this a go, shall we? Cheers. Merry Christmas. Yes, yes, yes. Just yes, go and buy it now. It's like, Okay, we need to talk about price later because that might be a sticking point. But oh, I knew, I knew, I had, I knew this was going to be one for me because ultimately, let's just think about this. I'm a massive whiskey fan in general. Really love bourbon. Old fashioned cocktail is my go-to. Like that's my favourite cocktails. Full stop. So it was going to be good. And I love chocolate orange stouts. So it was, it was meant to be this one. But I have to say. Now, I have to say, it does have the hallmarks of an old-fashioned, but because of that base stout, that richness, the licorice deep, malty, toasty, coffee, chocolatey bit, and the chocolate in this is actually the first time I've really noticed it out of the others, is really there. The chocolatey is more intense here. And as a result, this feels like the biggest, bougiest, booziest, Terry's Chocolate Orange, in the world. I'm actually having trouble trying to think about what to say because I'm just thinking about how good this would be as a kind of post Christmas dinner sipper. That is just outrageous. Oh, it just flows. Right. Okay. Top to bottom taste test because I'm just going to sit here rambling on about how brilliant it is and it's not going to help you very much. So, on the very tip of the tongue, very delicate carbonation and just a tiny bit of a sweet citrusy note. It's not even distinctly orange at this point. It's just, yeah, sweet fruit, definitely in the citrus camp, but you're not sure where it's going to go. Then, first third of the tongue. The orange comes out in full. Really orange forward. It's boozy though, there's a heat to it. 
feels a bit like, well, think of any other booze with orange in it. Things like mulled wine, sangria, things like this. It's got a flair of that in it, but without any of those grapey, acidic notes. The other notes along with it, though, is mainly, I think, the booze, but it brings with it a slightly spiced element. It might be some of the bitters, I'll be honest. Despite an old fashioned being my favourite cocktail, I've never just tried the bitters on their own. I don't actually know what they taste like other than being a bit bitter. Um, so it could be that. There's definitely this kind of spiced orange vibe there. Then onto the mid palette. The orange actually continues. There's still not really the introduction of anything else just yet. You start to get a bit of, I guess, just flavour creep. I think it's actually the woody barrel notes coming in, but they're not obvious to what they are. They're just kind of shifting the orange a little bit and it becomes quite, well, sweet, candied, you know. Um, think about the kind of caramel notes and stuff in uh, bourbon, vanilla, that sort of stuff. It's all there. It's becoming very much candied, kind of, kind of candied citrus peel. Then onto the back of the tongue. The orange still retains. It's going nowhere. But you start to develop some nice, big, roasty, dark chocolate notes that, again, you start this experience of a really boozy chocolate orange. It's there in droves and it's just getting richer and richer and richer. And then the aftertaste and kind of the after experience is where you really appreciate everything that's just gone on because everything almost lightens up. The orange is less intense. The chocolate is still there, but less intense. And there's this kind of mild heat. It is warming. It's a proper winter warmer, but it doesn't smack you around the face. It's there. It's just slowly rising after you've taken your sip. It's, I'll be honest, absolutely full of other flavours. Some of the licorice notes, some kind of raisin sultana, a little bit of even rye spice potentially from that bourbon barrel. But yeah, I mean, in a weird way, with the exception of the space side, it's one of the simpler forms in terms of the amount of flavours you can actually taste. But for me, it's just a stunner. That is easily my favourite so far, and I love the rest of them, but that, that is dangerous. And, uh, well, that's how much I've got left. And uh, I am very excited to go away and finish it. Before I do, though, we need to talk about accessibility, availability, price, and all that kind of stuff. So these are available from the Blue Monkey website and in store right now. However, there are a few ways to buy them. You can buy individual cans, and this is gonna be the sticking point, at the cost of 10 pounds a can. Now, they've been aging in first fill barrels for a very long time. I can understand the price, you know, their ABV's high, the duty's high. It's an expensive endeavour. Are they worth it? Absolutely. They are worth £10 a can if any of them suit your kind of flavour notes. Would I personally go out now and buy the Sherry one for £10 a can? Well, I really, really liked it and it was a surprise, but probably not. On the flip side, the one I've just tried, well, you have it on good authority. I'll be back there this week to get some more because that is absolutely stunning. You can buy them as a set, but that set is £60. So if you like the idea of all of them, it's still worth doing, in my opinion. It's a treat, once a year kind of thing. This is not bargain basement beer. This is experimental, you know, high outlay, high effort, all the rest of it. This is craft brewing, effectively. Um, so there is a cost involved with that. There is another way, though, that I think makes more sense with these. If you want all of these and some more beers, and don't want to feel like you're paying £10 a can, they do have a 12 beers of Christmas offer where you get all six of these plus six other beers for 85 quid. Sounds steep, but at least one of those other beers is also worth minimum £10 a can, if not more. That is Chimpain, and I can tell you outright that is berserk and a fantastic beer. Super high ABV, champagne yeast, like it is it, brilliant it's brilliant so and the, and the others in there are also fantastic even if they're not in the high end region in terms of price normally i understand that there will be some backlash for me to say these are worth it at 10 quid because it's only worth it if you like them and really really like them as i said i wouldn't necessarily myself go out and pay 10 pounds for every single one of these but i think that 12 for 85 deal actually is a bit of a stunner and yeah, I wonder if I can convince myself it's worth going to go and get another set because these are absolutely fantastic. And if you sat there thinking, Tom, you're laying this on a bit thick now, look, honestly, I'm just trying to be 
trying to be truthful i was given these so my opinion on them is not as if i've just parted with that much money so i need to be a bit careful but really like it, it, they're all the quality on these is exceptional the only thing that might put some people off is the fact that the consistency is not the thickest if you want big rich sticky indulgent impy stouts this is not what this is this is a masterpiece in barrel work really is what this is um, and as a big whiskey fan i find it absolutely fascinating so yeah for me it's worth it for you it may not be but hopefully i've given you enough information to make an informed decision and if you do or you're going to let me know in the comments below because i really don't want to know what other people think of these because i am over the moon with them and i think I better stop rambling on and go away and finish this glorious old-fashioned wild turkey barrel-aged imperial stout. That is a mouthful. And that really is all I've got to say about it. As you can probably tell, my cheeks, ears, head, everything got gradually pinker throughout this video, partially because of the very warm night and I've been talking for a very long time, and also mainly because of the ABV of this beer. But it is, as I say, an absolute gem. I'm going to go and get some more of these for Christmas Day, me reckons. But... That is all I've got to say about it. So as always, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like it. If you haven't already subscribed, if you'll be so kind. And I'll catch you next time. Merry Christmas. Cheers.